Okay. So, you can still see the screen, right? I just kind of. Um, uh, open yeah, if you, want, if you want to share your slides again. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I think I closed the window and. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, so sure. while you're doing that, so uh, hi, everyone. Um, so this week we're online only, obviously, and um, we are here with Hans Kirsting. I hope I pronounced that right. And he's yep. going to be talking about machine learning stuff and uh, the benefit role of stochastic noise in um, the stochastic uh, gradient descent. So uh, over to you, Hans. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be online in London with you all. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I, the, the title is either the beneficial role of uh, noise in XPD or alternatively exploration in this implicit bias due to SGD stochasticity. So we're going to have a look at uh, yeah, the beneficial role that noise can play in training large scale machine learning models. And I understand it's a mixed audience from uh, both statistics and machine learning. So uh, I'll try to strike a balance with uh, kind of for people who are experts in SGD and uh, for people who uh, might have used it, but maybe um, don't know too much about uh, the, the underlying theory. Um, and feel free to interrupt me and ask questions anytime, as in particular in an online setting, I think it's, it's helpful if you, if you uh, just go ahead with your questions if you have any. All right, so as you all probably know, um, large-scale machine learning models these days are being trained mostly with a version of stochastic gradient descent, which actually goes back to the 50s. Um, and, uh, well, then people have uh, different um, variants of this, of course. Uh, you maybe you've changed the machine learning model with um, um, uh, Adam, which is the standard optimizer right now, or use momentum methods and so on. But they're all kind of based on this plain vanilla algorithm. So this is kind of the OG of stochastic optimization algorithms, if you will. And uh, it's very simple. So it's like you could you can pictorially uh, think of let's say some kind of quadratic which you want to optimize. So you want to go from x to x star. By the way, uh, it would be useful to have some kind of pointer. You don't see it when I use my move my mouse, do you? We can see it. You can see it. Oh, awesome. Okay, great. All right, then my mouse, my finger, and you want to go from x to x star and. Yeah, what a gradient descent, of course, would do is just follow the gradient. Uh, but uh, in a large scale machine learning setting, you have huge neural networks which might have billions of parameters. So you would need uh, parts and derivatives with respect to all of these parameters. And that's intractable. And hence, people came up with stochastic gradient descent, which is extremely simple. You just kind of pick a random subset of all the parameters denoted by math cal i here. And the size of the subset is much smaller than uh, the size of uh, the dimensionality of your neural network. And then you just kind of um, use this uh, subsample stochastic gradient instead. And of course, by the law of large numbers, et cetera, this is an approximation of the two gradients. And uh, what's interesting and kind of uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that in the past, people tried variance reduction then to get this estimate of the stochastic gradient. You also see it when I mark something on the slides, right? I, I'm assuming, yeah. Um, close to the true gradient. So people wanted to do true gradient descent, but could only computationally afford the stochastic gradient descent, which is, of course, still the case. Uh, so people uh, in practice have been messing around with variance reduction to kind of get these estimates closer. But now it is increasingly being recognized that the noise is beneficial or that in phrase differently, you, there are arguments against the true, taking the true gradient even, even if you could afford it. And uh, from reading the literature, um, I would highlight three theories or three hypotheses, I should say, 
and how, and how this noise and stochastic gradient descent can be beneficial. The first one being that stochastic gradient descent compared to gradient descent exits spurious local minima more quickly. So local minima that don't give good predictions that you, that you want to leave in the optimization procedure. I mean, obviously, gradient descent is not going to uh, exit them, right? Um, yeah, because it has, like, there's no gradient inside while there were, might be a stochastic gradient. The second uh, hypothesis is that stochastic gradient descent exits saddle points more quickly. And the third hypothesis is that stochastic gradient descent is implicitly biased towards minima that generalize well. Um, oh, there's a question? Uh, to go, just go ahead and ask it. Um, I don't see that. I thought the chance that actually forces in some size can be very large. Uh, but for each point in the menu. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're right. I, I, I presented this as being a subset of the parameters. I'm not even sure why I said this, but it's, of course, a subset of the data uh, points. Yeah, thanks for pointing this out, uh, person who commented in the chat. Yeah, yeah, it's of course like huge, uh, huge data sets and only with respect to a batch of data points. I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I guess I didn't have enough coffee <laughs> today. Yeah, yeah, so, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so as a caricature uh, for the third hypothesis to kind of make it uh, plausible, uh, you might um, think of something like this. So maybe uh, there is kind of a wide but not so deep minimum right here, and there's a sharp but deeper minimum right there. And uh, if if you would just look at this picture, you would think that the minimum on the right is better, right? But uh, it turns out that that's not always the case. And you can uh, think of it as uh, if you would shake the landscape a little bit, uh, you would very quickly climb up the hill in the in the right minimum, while you wouldn't climb up the hill too much in the left minimum. So yeah, if you would change the data on which you compute the loss for today. Okay, so these are the three hypotheses, and in this talk uh, we will explore hypotheses one and three. These are hypotheses uh, that I've done research on. Uh, I haven't done research on hypothesis number two, so. Check out the papers that I that are linked for that. Uh, but yeah, depending on how much time we have, uh, so the slides are summarizing three papers. But uh, yeah, we would saw in this talk that anti-correlated noise injection can help generalization by finding set minima. And we will show that anti-correlated noise injection can help estimate local minima more quickly. And uh, we will uncover an effective loss for FCD with noise injection. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with uh, the first paper, uh, which relates the quality of exiting uh, local minima uh, by, uh, well, I'm sorry, like finding flat minima. So it relates to the third hypothesis of finding the minimum on the left compared to the minimum on the right. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's uh, look at this in a bit more detail. So assume that uh, you have a loss written L of some parameter W, and it's again an empirical risk. Uh, so you average over some labeled data where the data is XI and the labels are YI. And uh, this, uh, this uh, training loss is just like the stochastic gradient is an approximation to the true gradient, is an approximation of the generalization loss. So if you knew the probability measure P from which this uh, finite data set, xi, yi, is sampled, uh, and you would integrate over this probability measure, then you would obtain the true loss, L true. And um, in training, um, your networks with empirical risk minimization, you just hope that L is close to L2. Um, but as I will demonstrate now, these losses can be quite different. So consider uh, this uh, very simple example 
you can think of it as kind of um, yeah, one layer neural network with squared weights, if you like. So you have some design matrix X, uh, which has data points as row XI, uh, which are sampled from a standard uh, Gaussian. Um, you have uh, a true weight at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And the dimensionality is 140 data points and of dimensionality 100. And then you can uh, plot the uh, loss landscape. And so here, like if you if you look at the type of these subplots, you see uh, the n value increasing n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to five, n equal to one hundred. And uh, yeah, if if you sample one hundred data points, they're already kind of close to the generalization loss. But yeah, it of course looks drastically different for small number of data points. And that's of course only a toy example, but uh, and high dimensional neural networks are kind of difficult to plot and summarize statistically, but uh, you see different, uh, you see similar effects in uh, the real high dimensional neural networks. And um, yeah, what we are now interested in, what uh, the, the research that we did is, uh, so STD is uh, notoriously difficult to study, which is uh, which is why um, sometimes people, because like there's a big debate about what the noise actually looks like, is it heavy tails or not? Um, of course, the noise distribution, you could really write it down for the network, but you can't kind of integrate it. So as a kind of proxy model to study SPD, people study something called perp gradient descent, which is here denoted by PGD for perturbed. And uh, this is also known as the, uh, the stochastic gradient Longevon dynamics, if you've heard this word. And that's a kind of discrete algorithm which kind of just does gradient descent and then adds some noise, which is supposed to mimic the noise of stochastic gradient descent. And um, what we, the question that we asked in order to understand the properties of adding noise better is, Okay, assuming that this noise has a uh, beneficial effect, this kind of PGD noise, which is supposed to mimic SGD, has some beneficial effect, which has been demonstrated in the papers, which are linked in this overview view slide. Can we actually improve on PGD noise in order to improve uh, the, uh, the behavior of uh, stochastic optimization and also in order to um, understand what this noise actually does and where the beneficial effect comes from. And for this, after uh, experimenting a bit with different kinds of noises, we came up with this algorithm, which we call anti-PGD, uh, which is the same as PGD, but the only difference is that here, uh, you still have your IID standard uh, Gaussian random variables, but you look at the increment instead of the original random variables. And uh, the only difference is, of course, I mean, uh, um, some of Gaussian random variables are still Gaussian and so on, but now uh, two subsequent increments uh, have a non-zero correlation. Namely, if you just compute the correlation, you get minus one half times the identity matrix. So in other words, you're more likely to perturb to the right if you perturb to the left in the previous step, so to say, in 1D. And um, yeah, you can pictorially plot the curve. I mean, it's like an anti-correlated curve like this, just kind of, it's much more wiggly and uh, yeah, does more U-turns unsurprisingly. And um, yeah, this is the algorithm that we study. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna like, I'm, first I wanna demonstrate the effect that this algorithm has. And then I'm gonna, afterwards, I'm gonna give you some intuition and hopefully some sense of why we observe the beneficial behavior which I'm about to point you to in these uh, metrics. So let's first, I mean, it's a very simple algorithm, right? You just kind of take the, uh, you just, you know, take these increments and run it. I mean, it's nothing to it to implement it. 
And then you can kind of run it on some machine learning problems. And um, all right, so what's being shown in these uh, experiments here? So in the top row, you see um, just the test error. So that's the error that you actually care about, right? Not the train error, but on the test set. And you see it for different uh, algorithms, gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, perturbed gradient descent, and anti-perturbed gradient descent. And the columns are three different uh, problems, squared regression, uh, the toy example that I showed you, matrix sensing, and like a real large scale machine learning pro problem, ResNet 18 on Cypher 10. And uh, in the bottom row, you see the train Hessian trace. So pay attention to the train and not the test now. So it's the actual landscape that you train in so that your optimizer actually sees. And uh, you check the trace of the Hessian, which can be considered or is in fact one uh, standard way to assess the flatness of a minimum. So if you kind of uh, go back to this kind of caricature, of course, the train Hessian of this minimum on the left would be uh, smaller than of the one on the right, right? Because the Hessian is just the second derivative if you're on 1D. Okay, so, um, all right. And uh, what we observed is that, uh, first of all, we observed, which, which is well known, I mean, we're not the first people to observe that, that there's a, a usually a, a high correlation between how the uh, train has been evolved, so how the line on the, uh, in the how the bottom uh, row uh, evolves, and the uh, actual performance on the test set, in the sense that if the train has been goes down, then you get better performance. And that's, I think you can observe this over pretty much all lines here. Pay attention that uh, in the, on, the, in, on the column on the right, uh, the metrics are reversed because it's a classification task. So here we consider uh, test accuracy. So higher is better in this uh, on, the, on the right. And uh, yeah, we can see that, uh, yeah, like some unsurprising stuff, so stochastic gradient descent uh, behaves pretty well. Perturbed gradient descent is actually worse than stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so that's, I think, also kind of interesting for the comparison which people usually make. But then anti-PGD, the method that we propose, uh, drastically lowers the Hessian. So the orange line on the bottom is just going down and is, is the lowest in every single case. And also the performance of the um, of the actual actual model on the test set is best for the orange line. Um, yeah, so um, which is why we hypothesized that injecting anti-correlated noise improves uh, the generalization of the model by finding flatter minima. There are a few uh, kind of uh, Details to the plot. I mean, for example, like on the kind of real large scale problem, we had to stop noise injection at the very end. So we kind of first had to have it converge to an area and then stop the noise injection such that it actually settles down somewhere. Um, I guess that's something which we still need to understand better. But uh, yeah, we, we, we think that it's jumping around and then if we cool down the temperature at the very top, we can nicely settle down to the bottom of this uh, of this uh, local minimum in the train set. But yeah, these are the metrics, and uh, in fact, uh, yeah, that's that's the motivation to study this. And before we studied this, we didn't even expect that it would be so so good. We thought that turning up the correlation would be good, but it turned down correlation would be good. Is there any question on this before I go to the next slide? Uh, yes, I have a quick question. So, hello, Hans. Yeah. This is Omar. Uh, I asked you the, que the, the question in the chat, by the way. Thanks yeah. for the answer. Yeah, um, uh, this is very interesting, by the way. And I just like this, this, this plot caught my eye. And I had a quick question to ask, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. So I, I know uh, or I've heard a bit about uh, stochastic, you know, SGLD. 
stochastic gradient and Jevan dynamics that it, it yeah. has computation. It has computational costs, right? That's that's why. So it's interesting theoretically in some senses, but it is costly to compute. And I think there are problems even to like to tune it, you know, to find the parameter or the hyperparameters, whatever. But mm -hmm. I was wondering, so at least compared to that, so I know for SGLD that there is a cost to use it uh, that could be more than like let's say using SGD plus momentum or Adam, you know, like other optimizers. So, but anti PGD, what is the cost of that? Is, is there a catch in terms of like the compute? Right, so I guess, I mean, I'm curious about your statement that stochastic gradient large order dynamics has a cost to compute. So um, maybe like, let's see if we understand the same thing. So for me, stochastic gradient large order dynamics is like, you could look at this, what, what I call PGD here, and you could uncover yeah. a stochastic differential equation behind yes. such that the discretization of the stochastic differential equation would be this discrete time algorithm, right? And in the in the term that says gradient L, what is L, capital L? Is that the empirical loss? Yeah, that's the empirical loss, that's right. So, uh, no, no, so sorry, that is the true loss, yeah. That is the so, true loss. Yeah, so here, like, okay, let's, this, you're, okay, now I, I think I understand the, the, the question. So uh, with uh, stochastic radius launch more dynamics and its discretization, which we call CGD here, you essentially, uh, your drift term is the true loss in the, in the SDE, right? right? And then you add some noise. And in order to kind of have some model of what SGD might be doing. Okay, yes. Or, or an alternative to what SGD might be doing. And the computational cost of getting the true gradient is, of course, the computational cost of getting the true gradient. So um, it's expensive. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah I, I guess I should have highlighted this. So in order to kind of get the pure version of PGD and anti-PGD, you first need the true gradient, and then you add some perturbation to it. And sigma um, is something that you set uh, in what way? Like, how do you choose sigma in either case? Oh, right. Sigma, um, I think we just kind of uh, researched it or something. So right. um, it's, um, I, I didn't, like, I don't, if I remember correctly, it's not extremely sensitive to, like, getting this result, it's not extremely sensitive to sigma. Um, I'm going to have some interpretation of what this sigma actually does in a moment. Um, yes, may explain a little bit, but I, I I don't think I have a kind of very satisfying answer to that. No, like, that's fine. Thank you. I... It's it's possible that one could come up with some optimality criterion, but that, that's that's fine. Thank sure. you. This is I don't want to get you sidetracked from from okay, the okay, talk, okay. but this is thank you. This yeah, is sure, very sure. interesting. Thanks for the question, Omar. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, very good question. And I, I want to highlight uh, that uh, um, that kind of that we use the true gradient here is um, practically, of course, you would want to insert the stochastic gradient there uh, to save computation costs. But uh, usually, when people study PGD and also what we do here with anti-PGD is to really highlight the effect of the noise, we take the true gradient. Because then we can see what the noise actually does. In practice, you and I think we have some in the paper and the appendix. We have some experiments. Uh, you could use the stochastic gradient noise and add some um, anti-correlation noise on top. All right. Okay. So yeah. Uh, long story short. So uh, we observed that the performance from gets better if we insert anti-correlated noise, and we also observe that the test metrics get better. And there's more experiments in the paper. You can, you can look it up. I think it was, it's a pretty robust finding. <clears throat> and now uh, we are, of course, wondering why it, it works so well. And uh, so I'm going to offer two explanations for why it works well. These are, of course, like um, certain perspectives on something very complicated because like in high dimensions, uh, you know, um, when people tell you that they understand what's going on in deep 
deep neural networks, then uh, you can find so many theories about this. And this just like one perspective of what might be happening, what we find plausible from the evidence that we gathered. Okay, so one thing. Um, all right, so uh, one thing to notice is that if you paint the uh, the parameterization of your um, optimizer, so if you say instead of WN, so instead of the weight vector, let's consider the weight vector before the noise happens. So your stochastic optimizer kind of gives you some offset where you jump, uh, like the difference between where gradient descent would have taken you and where your stochastic optimizer takes you is this a noise variable uh, xi. And you just kind of subtract it and you, you take the variable where gradient descent would have taken you. And if you write the recursion with this variable, then um, you get gradient descent on a convolved loss. So uh, yeah, as it's written here, the noise variable xi goes in the brackets of the uh, gradient. And so in other words, um, um, you, if you compute the expectation, you compute some convolution over this random variable, right? So you put an integral and you get uh, that on average, uh, given Zn, your Zn plus one is Zn minus eta times some uh, gradient, L tilde, uh, plus a term of order uh, of the third order, third moment of the uh, noise. And um, this convolved loss um, is just your original loss plus a scaled, uh, a scaled summons of uh, the trace of the hash. So in other words, you uh, you kind of um, up to uh, third order terms, pick up, you take the gradient with respect to uh, L tilde instead of, of L. So not only do you minimize your loss L, but you also minimize your um, measure of flatness of a minimum, which is the trace of the Hessian. Okay, and um, one can then uh, do some math and show that under some technical assumptions, uh, which I can highlight, you can also see them in the paper. Um, if you uh, pick, um, like for example, a symmetric centered Bernoulli distribution with variant sigma squared. This is just to have a bounded noise to make the proof a bit easier. I think one can probably extend it to unbounded noise. And if you uh, assume that your uh, step size shrinks with eta divided by sigma squared, and if you take at most n steps of order sigma squared times eta to the minus one, uh, and eta is just the uh, positive variable, of course. Then it holds true that uh, the average of your the squared norm of this modified loss is smaller than uh, O of eta plus O of sigma to the three. Um, yeah, which is in in optimization uh, kind of a standard way of demonstrating that a specific kind of quantity is um, controlled when the algorithm converges somewhere. So as the algorithm converges somewhere, uh, these gradients become small, is the essence of this theorem. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the first attempt to um, explain the um, empirical evidence that we gathered. And um, yeah, if there are no questions on this, we I have a second, maybe uh, less, maybe even more intuitive, at least to me, uh, attempt to explain this. And um, 
So sorry, okay. I, I have a I have a question on this part. Yeah. That's okay. Um, hi. So, so when you were talking about projected uh, perturbed gradient descent as a model for SDG, yeah. for SGD, you you mean that um, really you're injecting some kind of noise? Uh -huh. uh, you're really estimating the gradient with some noise by the fact that you're taking this mini batch and you sort of model the noise as this zero mean random variable. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, so so then in order to achieve this kind of anti-correlated noise in practice, what are you proposing doing something uh, something else to how you do the mini batching or are you imagining actually adding this noise in in more of an SGLD style? Uh, adding this noise in. So yeah, we've been asked uh, by, like this is a question which comes up a lot, like could you, um, Puts you in practice, of course, you don't want to uh, compute the true gradient. Mm -hmm. And then you want to have anti correlated noise in a kind of SGD mini batching kind of way, right? Yeah. And this is the question which comes up a lot. And uh, all I can say that is maybe you can pick the mini batches such that you get anti correlation. Sure. Uh, it's not like an extremely satisfying answer, I guess. Like if the mini batches would be very large, that would be easy because then. The overlap would be like you could just kind of pick one half and then the other half. Sure. But yeah, I, I don't have a better answer than that. And that's, I guess, something which wants to explore, maybe. Yeah. No, no, fair enough. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, great. Then let's uh, look at the um, second. Um, oh, there's another question. Have you tried doing gradient descent until the L? Anticorrelated PGD, does it inherit its benefit? Uh, yes, we have tried that. And I think at the very end of the talk, uh, we're going to have something on that. And if, yeah, so I think the answer is yes. Like you kind of, if you run, um, if you take this, very loss and you run gradient descent on it, you get similarly good behavior. And 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 I should say, I should say that uh, this is like an extremely central point that we do gradient descent on the convolved loss. Because of course we're not the only the first ones to do this. You can like convolution optimization is a well established technique. And like if you look at the, the paper, we have a kind of section of related work and there's like very kind of standard optimization work on this. And in a sense, like if I kind of wanted to briefly summarize this paper, I would say, look, this is like a one sample approximation of gradient descent on a convolved loss, right? You kind of just draw one sample and you don't compute the expectation. So yeah, um, I guess it just speaks to the power of convolution, which is a technique with people in optimization, of course, low and appreciate. All right, um, then let's have a look at the second attempt to explain this. And I actually think that um, that's probably what's happening here. So it's always difficult to know what, like in, in large dimensions, in, in high dimensional spaces, it's, it's difficult to be sure, but okay. So you can, like, let's take a, let's take a step back, right? Um, and if you check the machine learning literature, then there's a bunch of papers and in particular, I would point you to this paper that I linked here from Drugstar et al. that demonstrate that two global minima are usually connected by a manifold of such local minima, uh, which are equally good, right? So uh, uh, yeah, this kind of purple area is just kind of a bunch of minima and you can draw a path there without kind of climbing up the mountain. While if you went straight, uh, you would have to climb over the mountain. And of course, uh, like it's very expensive to kind of find these, these paths. All right, and um, and this made us wonder a little bit because uh, often we saw that uh, the train loss kind of remained flat. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I don't have these plots in the presentation, but you can find it in the paper. The train loss remained flat, but the Test loss got better as the train hasn't decreased. 
which is why we thought, okay, perhaps you are kind of in a narrow part of this Turtle Valley and you go to a wider part of this Turtle Valley through the noise, which of course the gradient can't do it because it's equal depth. And in order to um, explore this hypothesis, uh, we kind of came up with the most minimal uh, kind of valley that you could think of where the Hessian would actually uh, aim as you go along the valley. So with this like a completely straight uh, valley, so no curve. And uh, yeah, you can think of this loss here. L U V is equal to one half V squared times norm of U squared. And um, yeah, so the norm, uh, as you increase the norm of U, the Hessian increases, like if you just write down the Hessian. And uh, as you go to U equal to zero, uh, your Hessian becomes infinitesimally, infinitesimally small. And um, for every point with V equal to zero, um, you have a local minima. So V equal to zero is just your one dimensional manifold through the high dimensional V plus one dimensional space. Okay, and so we run a bunch of experiments on this kind of toy problem with the different uh, methods, NTPGD, PGD. And um, we observe the following. So on the left, you see the trace of the Hessian of the train loss. And uh, on the right, you see the dynamics uh, along this valley, right? So on the left, you go to wider parts of the valley, and on the right, you go to more narrow parts of the valley. Um, right, so on the left, the uh, Hessian of the train loss is lower, as you can see here. So you start at the star, and then the dynamics are you go to the left with anti PGD, you go to the right with PGD and gradient descent, of course, doesn't do anything, it just remains stuck. And yeah, you can see the Hessian behavior on the left. Uh, and Right, I mean, you can even like in your head imagine what's happening, right? Like you kind of pick up speed along this valley if you kind of perturb to both sides because you kind of integrate over the valley, so to say. While if you don't kind of you turn around, it's just much more erratic and uh, the high dimensionality of the point, the, the space puts you out, right? If you just have a Brownian motion, so to say, then you you leave for high dimensional spaces, right? I think starting from U to three, you can show that. And um, yeah, it uh, holds true for different uh, values of sigma. So I don't think, if I remember correctly, none of the experiments are particularly sensitive to sigma. Um, yeah, so here you see, um, kind of, it's a, it's a kind of a different setup where you are asking. We start at u square equal to d, and we are we are asking, uh, kind of, do we, uh, and do we, uh, where do we exit a um, a, a interval, an interval where either do we increase d to d equal to alpha, or do we uh, increase uh, u uh, norm of u squared, or do we decrease it? When we decrease this, that's good because we go to a flat part of the valley. And if we increase it, that's bad because we go to a sharp part of the valley, so to say. And you can see that uh, uncorrelated noise injection, well, it has a lot of noise, obviously, but it tends to uh, exit through the top while anti-correlated noise injection actually doesn't have much noise at all and kind of picks up the curvature and uh, exits through the bottom. And the reason why we set up this experiment like this although it proves the same point as the previous plot, is that you can actually prove that. Um, so yeah, you need high dimensions because of this effect that you get some kind of drift, uh, that you kind of, you drift away from the flat part through the high dimensionality of the space, but otherwise under some technical assumptions, enough derivatives and so on. If you consider, uh, this domain on this loss where kind of you start in this interval, which you can either exit to the bottom or to the top, or some fixed alpha. And if you uh, start optimizing in the middle, 
then your uncorrelated noise convection diverges away from zero and your anti-PGD goes to zero, uh, even regardless of dimension in this case, uh, in expectation, of course. Um, yeah, so that concludes uh, the second attempt to try to explain this nice empirical behavior that we found. And um, yeah, bottom line, I would say that um, to me, I mean, like looking back on this paper, I would say that it speaks to the power of convolution. Um, we first didn't think of convolution and only later when we tried to explain it, we saw, oh, this is just a way to implement convolution. So you can use, um, you can use correlation to get to something, to get to an acceptable implementation of convolution. That's what I, what, what I would say. And I feel that convolution is not sufficiently appreciated in the machine learning community as I see it. It's kind of more known in the optimization world. And I think large scale machine learning could benefit from uh, incorporating convolution more. That's the one bottom line I would say about this project. And the other thing I would say is that um, yeah, it's um, there are a bunch of other pa uh, papers which also kind of demonstrate that you kind of move along the valley like this. Sanjeev Aurora, for example, has a bunch of papers. So my opinion is that this is probably probably the case that you end up in some manifold of minima, and then you just kind of want to travel along it to some some area which is kind of beneficial for generalization. So these are for me the kind of two insights from this uh, project. Okay, uh, let me check the time. All right, time moves quickly. Um, so I think I would even uh, skip over this paper here. It's very technical. It kind of analyzes more the what correlation actually does using tools from probability theory and so on. Um, yeah. But it, it, it essentially kind of, it's a more technical way to make the same point, which are just made in hopefully an intuitive way. Um, so maybe I'm just gonna skip over this uh, part and arrive at uh, this paper, um, which, um, yeah, it's, I think it's, we, we published it at, uh, at uh, ITML, so it's not an archive anymore. Um, which, and it tries to um, take a more specific look at this quantity uh, L tilde, which I mentioned, right? I mean, recall this quantity here, L tilde, this convolved loss. And we're now kind of asking the question, uh, yeah, what's up with this L tilde, essentially? Uh, for specific machine learning problems, what's up with this L tilde? And can we recognize something about the regularization which may take place from looking at this attitude? Okay, so that's this paper. And um, all right, let's let's jump into it. I mean, once again, uh, yeah, we have PGD and anti-PGD, which I already showed you here because we are smarter now and we have understood that anti-PGD does some convolution. We already wrote it in the kind of convolved form, and um, all right, that's uh, the algorithms that we look at. And the questions that we ask is, is there an explicit regularization by small perturbations in this case? So if we let the variance of uh, the noise variable go to zero, uh, do we, can we explicitly see how uh, this is still different from gradient descent? And we also have some practical suggestions on how to actually perturb over parameterized models. And we demonstrate when this might be useful in practice. Okay, so um, I told you that we want to kind of explicitly see uh, what such a convolved loss might look like. Okay, and um, to this end, we kind of drill open this loss. Uh, well, we, I mean, uh, I guess everybody knows that usually a uh, complete loss consists of a machine learning model, phi, which is 
then kind of set into a loss function, like your squared loss or your whatever class misclassification metric. And you get the complete loss, which we denote by R here. So it's L, L of phi. And um, right, NTPGD, uh, yeah, that's the same thing, but it just adds noise, as we already uh, proved in the um, in the first theorem, which we had in this uh, presentation. Okay, and uh, now we want to kind of have a more explicit look, and for this we just take the good old Taylor expansion, and we just compute all the derivatives and third order derivatives, the k dual most of the times and so on. And we uh, put everything together and we get this term here. So just like in the first part of the presentation, up to third order terms, we have uh, what this smooth loss does. Um, but um, now we can see the machine learning model in it. That's the difference. We now see phi, which is a neural network or whatever. Okay, and then uh, we can, um, we're interested in like, that, that's maybe a bit cryptic, but what we're interested in is like, what does this effectively do? And for this, we paid attention um, to, the contribution of these different summons. And we found that effectively, one of these summons is, has little uh, bearing on the behavior of optimizers. So uh, this summons right here, uh, which is this summons here, uh, we, we claim that it can be dropped just like the O to the sigma to the three term. And we define the effective loss, which is just the two sums which are left. And we justify this by this theorem. And then there will be another theorem, which, which I think is, is the, the most important one. But first of all, we uh, realize that if phi and L are three times continuously differentiable functions with uniformly bounded third derivatives, and if the tensor product of the Heshton with the identity is zero for all W to two, for all weights, then we can show that the convolved loss minus the true loss is sigma squared close. And also the convolved loss minus the effective loss is sigma to the three close. Meaning that of course, by the triangle inequality that the effective loss is also sigma to the two close to uh, R2 uh, to the true loss. That is one theorem that we have about this. And the other theorem which I feel is the more important one is under some technical assumptions. Um, like it's, yeah, it's, it's on the equivalence of the minimizers. So yeah, where the global minimum of these losses actually is. So we assume that there's a unique global minimizer of, of, of uh, the true loss, which is pi squared. And we assume that there's a, uh, minimize the, of the smooth loss denoted by W squared sigma, and that there's a, a minimizer of the effective loss, which we defined. Um, and then we can show that, not that the minimizers are closed, because of course in high dimensional over parameterized models, you cannot show that, because there are like always lots of symmetries and other minimizers and so on. So the best thing that you can hope to show is that the predictions from the minimizers are closed, right? And um, yeah, we can show that kind of um, the minimizing prediction of the true loss is sigma to the two close to the um, minimizer of the smooth loss. And that the minimizer of the effective loss is sigma to the two close to the minimizer of the smooth loss, which of course you can triangle inequality it again. And uh, yeah, they're all sigma to the two close to each other. Right, so that is kind of the um, theoretical reason that we um, give for this, what we call the effective loss. And yeah, if there 
no questions on that, um, I'm also going to have some experiment, experimental investigation of this claim. Um, oh, first, uh, first, um, yeah, I'm mindful of the time. But okay, so let, first let me say that uh, now that you uh, have seen why we consider the effective loss, we can compute it for some machine learning models. And the cool thing is that if we can compute it, we get some uh, regularizers, which are actual regularizers which we can use. So in other words, like noise injection has an asymptotically equivalent effect to adding a regularization for some specific examples. So for the uh, Lasso and L1 norm, we see that uh, um, the regularization that we get um, is exactly uh, the Lasso regularization. And um, we can also demonstrate that for linear networks, we get a nuclear norm penalty as an explicit regularizer. We just do the math. Uh, and I think we have some a few more examples in the paper. Okay, I'm very mindful of time and I want to um, leave some time for questions. Um, okay, so then, yeah, we essentially have some way to smartly uh, inject noise in, uh, into uh, uh, deep nets, and, uh, but I want to skip over that. And what I want to get to to conclude the talk is some experiments, which I think also relates to a question that one of you asked about in the chat about uh, what if we run gradient descent on uh, the uh, kind of L tilde, or in this case, the effective loss. <clears throat> All right. So what we what we do here is that we study different um, yeah, neural networks, so like small models and a bit, bit of a larger model, uh, so 50 and 300 hidden neurons. So these are, of course, not um, large-scale machine learning problems. It's just a, as a demonstration. And uh, we can see that um, um, we can see that gradient descent plus noise with this well, there are two versions. I skipped over one of the versions, but there's these kind of the blue and the violet line. Uh, they are very close to the green line, which is gradient descent on the regularized loss. While gradient descent does something differently, right? So, and in this sense, uh, we argue that also empirically, uh, gradient descent um, on a regularized loss is close to the noise injected uh, version. Um, right, and then in the larger model, well, that's what I skipped over, but you smartly need to inject the noise such that the variance doesn't blow up. Uh, the smartly injected noise, layer-wise noise, is uh, close to the regularized loss. And in this sense, we feel that this validates uh, experimentally the regularized loss. And uh, these were, of course, like toy problems, but we can see similar behavior on um, large scale machine learning problems. So here we have some deep neural networks on fashion MNIST and Cypher 10. So com computer vision image classification. And uh, we can see that the layer wise perturbed stochastic gradient descent obtains its best test accuracy, which I guess speaks to the power of adding noise or of Convolution. And um, also the layer-wise perturbed stochastic gradient descent converts to a set minimum. Um, right. So yeah, here we we didn't run gradient descent on the perturbed loss, which of course is uh, very uh, expensive. But uh, yeah, this just to demonstrate uh, that these method actually work well in practice. All right, I think I should slowly come to an end. Uh, yeah, there's some more stuff on layer wise computation. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, the same with Slack for more probabilistic ML idea in the book that I published with Philip Henning and Mike Osborne on probabilistic numerics, where you can find more similar ideas like this on optimization and other numerical problems. 
Yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks. Thank you for listening. And um, I'm happy to receive more questions if there are any. Right. Thanks, Hans. Um, probably see a little hands clapping. Um, that was great. So we've got uh, Hans said that he has to leave sharply on the hour. So we've got a couple of minutes for questions, which I can take now. Can I jump in with a question? Yeah, sure, go for it. Thanks, Hans, for the talk. This was this was really good. Um, in, I'm interested in the anti what was it called anti anti-PGD. <laughs> anti-PGD. Anti yes, I think you partly answered the question that I had in mind. You said in the talk, so it, it can be applied to any chosen objective function. Like you know, I can choose my favorite objective function and then apply. PGD to it in the same sense as other optimization methods can be applied to, to an objective function? Or is this mm -hmm. designed specifically for like the loss being the risk or something, no problem? How flexible it is? Can I understand anti-PGD as a general purpose optimization method that I can apply to my favorite optimization objective? Yeah, yeah, that's like, I mean, just look at the recursion, it's extremely simple. So. You right. just need to draw a bunch of random variables, you know, like numpy, random, Gaussian, or whatever the function is, yeah. and then and then just add it to your gradient descent. So okay. it's 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 really extremely. Uh, it can be. It's not limited to any specific problem. Um, and as I said, I mean, I just kind of want to um, repeat that it's an implementation of convolution in a sense. So convolution is really something that, well, convolution, so I would say this is more applicable than convolution because convolution, uh, you can, it's tricky to implement because you need to compute the integral, right? And this is just a kind of one sample, um, one sample um, approximation of the integral. So it's, yeah, okay. a lightweight, Late lightweight implementation of convolution, which you can apply to any uh, optimization problem. Okay. The, the other comment was about that slide in your theorem. I think the second theorem. Uh, in the first part or the second part of the talk? The second part, all, almost to the end yeah. of your talk. Yeah. Uh, you passed it already, I think. This one. That one. Yeah, this one. I couldn't make out the norms there, I, I think, I thought this fee produced real values. Is that not the case? What is, I guess the question is, what is this fee, the function capital fee? Oh, that's just your machine learning uh, model. So that is like- Oh, it could, it could be vector valued then. Uh, that's- What is the output of, you feed it, is a W oh, is the uh... input? Yeah, I think it, it really doesn't matter. It's just, just some vector. Like it's, okay. uh, you know, you just, it, yeah. yeah, like you just kind of. I see, yeah, that answers, my, quantity. that answers my question. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so that's three o'clock. So I think we're gonna wrap up. So just to say one last time, thanks very much, Hans. That was fantastic. I'll be in touch uh, about the video and, um, uh, yeah, thanks for um, taking the time. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed this. And yeah, thanks for all the interesting questions. And um, yeah, it was, was a pleasure. Thanks. Cool. Then um, have a nice day, everybody.